Yes. So, um, yep. Great. So, um, the uh, title is a bit um, is a bit provocative. Twelve Angry Things: Some Possible Old Norse Legalisms in Old English Texts. Uh, of course, as you could tell, I was uh, referring to and I was recycling a famous movie uh, set in produced in 1957. If I'm not um, if I'm not mistaken, Twelve Angry Men. Uh, the focus of which is, as you can tell, on the jury in a, an American um, uh, court of law. Uh, but uh, yes, I have to say that it was a bit provocative of me, and of course it was more to attract the attention of my readership. Uh, so I hope you will uh, forgive me this uh, frivolous naming. Now, um, oh, I'm going I'm to have to click. Now, a quick introduction of where this has been published. And when uh, the material was presented in early summer this year, and uh, it appeared in print in uh, September 2020, the journal that accepted the paper is provocatively called Scandia Journal of Medieval Norse Studies, or as my supervisors and I, and I call it, Fake Scandia, um, due to obvious reasons, as you can tell. Uh, this journal is recently started, and surprise, surprise, it is hosted in Brazil. But I've heard of this journal first uh, in a student conference in Aarhus in 2019. And looking at their advisory board and editorial board, I was convinced that um, it is going to be a good avenue for uh, Nordic research now and in the future. The journal is listed in the Norwegian Register for Scientific Journal Series and Publishers. It is, as, uh, as, it is assessed as scientific level 20, uh, uh, scientific level 1, so it's not that top tier, but uh, at least our department is going to get some, um, as far as I understand the procedure, is going to get some money for it once the article is registered and reported. Yes, um, now that I have bolstered my ego a bit, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce the problem that I was trying to tackle uh, today. Um, I'm not sure if that... Uh, can you see this uh, zoom, uh, uh, the zoom bar, or is it only my screen that I can see it from? Can you only see my, my presentation? Only presentation? Okay, good. Um, then it's just how Zoom works. So the problem that I was tackling here uh, in, this particular, in this particular article was um, trying to introduce some new uh, sources into a very long and protracted debate in the Scandinavian uh, historiographical traditions surrounding the four to six runic inscriptions that commemorate certain thanes. Uh, on the uh, right hand side you can see the map of where those uh, runic inscriptions are located and I would like to uh, mention that mistake that I'm or that factual um, uh, that factual uh, correction that I need to make here uh, those 46 runic inscriptions uh, can be roughly broken into two big patterns depending on the formulae that uh, are used on those stones. So the two identifiable formulae are Gother Thane or something similar, uh, Mjok Gother Best or whatever you have there. And the second formula would be Throtter Thane or the Thane of Strength. Now, in the text that you all received, I wrote that there were 34 Gawler Thane uh, runic inscriptions. In fact, there are 35. That was my mistake. I overlooked uh, uh, Sermon, uh, St Sermon Landstone 34, which on this map is marked in, in red. <clears throat> in this uh, particular uh, chart, you can see the distribution of where those... Uh, stones are located and using this opportunity I would also like to thank my colleague Thomas Eckholm from uh, GU Print Service who helped me produce this map as Benjamin and I were discussing just before we met. Um, well, it's not very easy to produce maps, uh, not at all, especially if you're not familiar with the uh, technology. So very much uh, thank you to him. Um, okay, I'm going to have to use the mouse. So the problem is that uh, there, is not su there is not enough runic uh, context to actually uh, expound on who those commemorated thanes were, which sparked a long-standing uh, debate in uh, the Scandinavian historiography. For the sake of the argument, I'm going to call it one historiography, even though I understand there are actually three national schools. 
uh, I hope you will forgive my simplification here. So one interpretation was offered by Sen Okia, who in 1927 published a very long and uh, really elaborate article called All Danish Things and Drains. And again, I have to disclaim that I'm going to be pronouncing the word drain in the in an English fashion, uh, not in Old Norse. I hope, again, you will forgive me. His main, uh, Sven Ockers, that is, his main argument was that uh, things on those runic, in those runic inscriptions should be interpreted as uh, retain, kings, retainers, and or noblemen. And he used, to, he used Anglo-Saxon material to um, ground his uh, hypothesis. Uh, almost 20 years later, uh, Danish um, runologist Karl Martin Nielsen wrote a response, Var tænerne og drænerne kunglige hilme? And his main thesis was that if you remove the Anglo-Saxon material, you are left with the conclusion that those people commemorated in those runic conscriptions are the local well-to-do bønder, which itself is a term, uh, for the sake of the English argument, I will call them, well, local clan leaders, uh, local prominent farmers, because Bunder is not exactly a farmer, but it's also not exactly a clan leader. You can say local important people, local magnates, uh, local bosses, if you will. Um, his argument was derived from the runic and toponymic analysis. Now, uh, what the problems here are, is that uh, the Okierians, as I call them, so people who sided with Okier's interpretation, had to rely on Anglo-Saxon material and completely, uh, ig well, I wouldn't say ignore, but had to sidestep the um, uh, Old Norse uh, material proper. But one thing that is not often recognized is that when they had to rely on the Anglo-Saxon sources, they chose, willingly or not, to derive their argument from a very monarchocentric sources uh, from Wessex, first of all, charters and laws. And Wessex is not equal with all of England in the 11th century, for instance. The problem with the Nielsenist interpretation, uh, the people who agreed with Kalmar Nielsen, is that they sidestepped the Anglo-Saxon sources, and, um, and there was a methodological problem in that uh, when deriving their um, argument from uh, later Old Norse sources, they didn't, they had to I wouldn't say ignore, but they had to allow the, temp the temporal gap. Our written sources are from the 13th century at the earliest, whereas our runestones are from the late Viking Age, which is, well, roughly the mid-11th century at the latest. So at least 150 years, maybe 200, maybe even 300. So a lot, a lot of things had to change, um, or could have changed. The common problem is that the range of sources that uh, had been introduced uh, um, by Ockier and by Nielsen had been revisited since 1945, at least in the main, in the main point. Now, what my own uh, contribution to this debate is, I tried to look at the Anglo-Saxon material, which is contemporary with, contemporaneous with the uh, runic inscriptions, but which is not uh, monarchocentric and which is not West Saxon per se. So, to simplify, I was trying to look at what Scandinavian meanings the word Thane could have had in Old English texts recorded uh, contemporarily with uh, the runic inscriptions. Uh, for the sake of the argument, I'm going to refer to the Scandinavian England as the Dane law. This is a bit anachronistic because uh, this very term is late. It refers to the uh, legal situation first and foremost, and much less to the ethnic situation. Uh, there is a lot of um, Anglo-Norman tradition in identifying the Dane law. It's a very fluid concept, but if I had to explain it every single time, you would probably get tired and a bit upset with me and my method of presenting it. It's not exactly pedagogical. Uh, the map that you see here is the conventional map of the Dane law. Uh, in the roughly 10th and 11th century. Um, so again, there's a, a, certain, a certain degree of simplification in this map, but this is just for the context. Now, um, as I said, I wanted to look at some uh, Old English, non-West Saxon, non monarch centric texts, and uh, I'll have to omit lots of details here. So I will only concentrate on uh, two big texts and uh, a bunch of miscellaneous and only briefly recap what I tried to argue in my, the main body of my article. So first, 
uh, I looked at the text called Wall Reef. It is probably dated to roughly the year 997. Um, we know that it definitely has some connection to Old Norse by the usage of the word Neving, which is, comes from Old Norse Nivinger. Neving, um, so my check of the Old English uh, corpus uh, has revealed, appears in Old English only four, t um, four or three times. So there is, no, there is no debate on the prominence. On the provenance, uh, Nivinger is an Old Norse word, first and foremost. And uh, what I uh, strangely found um, interesting here is that the syntax and the um, the syntax and the context of Wolrif seem to overlap a lot with the much later Gula things log. Uh, in Old English, we read that Wolrif is needing as deed, which roughly can be translated as corpse robbery is a deed or act of a needing. And in Gula things log, we read something extremely similar. Uh, Nivings work is or er f mother yer Valrov. Basically, we have the uh, overlapping between Valrov and Wolrif. We have Nivings work and Nivings dead, and that suggests to me that this is probably not exactly just a uh, coincidence. But of course, we could probably say, well, could have been a coincidence. But another important thing is that the way that Wolrif uses the word thane is not very characteristic of uh, West Saxon Old English. And as I'm going to try and argue later, it is much more characteristic of, what, of how Old Norse texts use it. So my uh, uh, hypothesis is that Wolrif is a one-sentence, one-clause uh, piece of Old Nordic legislation, but written in Old English some two, three hundred years before the Scandinavian provincial laws were put to parchment in Scandinavia proper. The second important text that I looked at is the Wantage Code of King uh, Ethelred. Now, I said monarchocentrical. Well, this is a royal law code, but it seems to codify the local norms in the Dane law, and more specifically in the five boroughs in the central Dane law. It is very laden with Nordicisms. Uh, at least 12 have been identified. And uh, the, I think, single most important contribution uh, to uh, the debate on... Um, the institutional importance of this text has been Charlotte Knapp's uh, article from 1987 in which she tried to argue that the 12 elder or leading thanes who act as sort of a jury um, could have been an institutional uh, borrowing from Scandinavia. What, sh what Charlotte Knapp didn't concentrate on was the language per se of those uh, jury institutions. And I myself am willingly sidestepping the problem of institutional transfer. I'm not going to argue whether there was a, a, a legal transfer or transmission from Scandinavia to England or vice versa. This is not my uh, focus today. Uh, but what I have noticed is that Old English also knows the expression of the leading men, and normally it would be Uldesten or men or something similar. Anglo-Saxon legislation uh, does operate with groups of 12 or multiples, like 36 at, and, uh, yes, 36, or 6. Um, so Anglo-Saxon legislation knows those groups as legal collective actors, but the opposition of the uh, elder or leading thane and thane and 12 happens only in the Wantage Code. So my question is, could it have been a Nordicism? Well, if we look at the text from the Old English perspective, hardly, because there is nothing to go with. Thane is perfectly recorded in, uh, in Old English at least 2,000 times, so the, the corpus says, so why would we expect that? We could expect that because of the, again, linguistic and syntactical overlappings that we find in Old Norse. So um, this, um, this fragment on the, uh, at the top is a fragment from the Wantage Code, you see that thanes, uh, those 12 thanes, are supposed to pronounce a verdict, which is called dom, and this is extremely reminiscent of what we find in Old Norse, where we have in Gulathing, we have the uh, verdict or dom of 12 thanes um, in the paragraph 266, 
and we have a similar phrase in Graugas. Uh, we have the uh, Domer of uh, or Dom of uh, th uh, twelve things. It's also important to note here that, at least according to the later uh, literary tradition, uh, Gula things log is uh, derived. Oh, uh, sorry, um, Graugas is derived from Gula things log. I'm not going to discuss whether it's actually a fact or if it's a more of a literary tradition, but I think it's important to mention. Also important to mention here is that both Gula things log and Graugas are this sort of this uh, so-called non royal legislation in that they are not uh, promulgated in the king's name as is the case with later Scandinavian provincial laws such as for instance Landslov or Jonsbok in Iceland. So my interpretation is that if we go back, if we go here, that those 12 uh, leading things in the five boroughs are actually uh, linguistically the same people who are mentioned in Gulathing's log and in Graugas. Uh, finally, the miscellaneous texts are three, the Thanes Guild in Cambridge, the Northumbrian Priest's Law, and the, uh, the Sermon of the Wolf to the English by Archbishop Polston. All of them come from the uh, 11th century. With the Northumbrian Priest's Law, it's a bit more difficult to date because uh, we know it's post Wolston, and we know that Wolston died in the year 1023. It's post Wolston and pre Norman Conquest, so mm, it's a span of at least a few decades. Uh, the Thanes Guild in Cambridge uh, can be dated uh, with the uh, Terminus uh, Postquem. Uh, this is based on the uh, script and on the manuscript with the, with the Archbishop Wolston's um, sermon. Uh, this is dated on, the, uh, on knowing the context of his writings. All of those texts on their own, well, could be interpreted from the West Saxon perspective as, well, mentioning something peculiar. But if we're bringing the Scandinavian perspective, I think there is good grounds to at least speculate, as I do, or maybe to suspect that those texts, which are not royal, and which are uh, describing something in the Scandinavian part of England, actually use the word Thane in the sense that is much more characteristic of the later Old Norse usage, namely a free man in general, a free and fully uh, politically active uh, member of a community. Uh, by extension, we could speculate that it could mean a local prominent, um, local prominent, if not boss, but a local prominent member of the elite, but this is, of course, would be just a logical uh, extension of, the, of, this, um, of this hypothesis. Uh, especially with Archbishop Wollstone, I'd like to draw the attention to the word Thaingüld and also the opposition of Thanes to Threls, because Thaingüld is not mentioned in Old English texts whatsoever, but in this text, whereas in Old Norse, this is uh, mentioned at least uh, if I'm not mistaken, at least 33 times according to the um, Dictionary of Old Norse Prose in Copenhagen. Um, Thaingild could have been coined by Wollstone on the precedent of Theofgild, that is the uh, fine for stealth, but I cannot exclude that it is a sort of Scandinavian coinage. What I do not know and what I don't think we can establish is where it was coined. But what is important is that, well, if the truth is always on the side of the bigger battalions, probably it's a Scandinavian word, not, uh, not Old English. It could have been coined in, in the Dane law. It could have been coined in, and, and from the Dane law, it could have been brought to Scandinavia. It could have been coined in Scandinavia and brought to the Dane law. This is not exactly relevant right now. Thainothrel, this is a common phrase in a lot of uh, Scandinavian legislation and also in some of, um, of some of the, um, some other prose. This phrase is characteristic of Wollstone's prose. Wollstone is known for his love for Nordicisms, but this phrase is completely absent from uh, old uh, English texts outside Wollstone. So my interpretation is that Sermio Lupi ad Anglos, the, uh, the sermon that I'm discussing here, actually uh, is laden with Nordicisms and Thane, Thingult and Thainathrel here are used in the Scandinavian usage, uh, in the Scandinavian meaning much more than in Old English meaning. So uh, my conclusion from all of this 
is uh, four facts, or things that I think are facts, and two hypotheses. Uh, one is that thin in Old English can be polysemic, can mean more than one thing, and this is still work in progress. Two is that thin can indeed denote king's retainers, as uh, postulated by the Ocarians, but this is first of all recorded in the uh, formula Kungus uh, a similar phrase, uh, Konungs Thane, is not recorded on Old Norse, I did check it uh, thoroughly in both Skaldic verse and in prose, I don't think it's there. And uh, if we look at the Old English texts outside the uh, monarchocentrical text, Thane doesn't have to mean uh, a king's Thane, a king's vassal, and when it's not a king's vassal, it sometimes in the Dane law can mean a free member of a community or by extension a free man. And this seems to be a uh, reminiscent of the later Old Norse usage. These, I think, are facts. My hypotheses and my interpretation are the following. First, that in Old Norse, Thane could have meant free man already in the late Viking age. Therefore, and simply that th this meaning was not preserved um, in the sources before they were written down, because, well, they were not written down. We only have their own stones. Therefore, my second hypothesis is that we probably can interpret the word Thane in the runic inscription in, um, in line with the Old Norse meaning and not Old English, simply because it is... Um, I don't think it requires as many um, interdependent links and, uh, co and um, concessions that we have to make if we interpret the things in the runic inscriptions as king's vassals bearing on the Anglo-Saxon material. So these are my uh, hypotheses. These are going to be integrated in my thesis. And I'm now very much uh, looking forward to what you have to say about it.